Hello and welcome to the TT Podcast. This is a podcast where we talk to one person from the world of the TT races to discuss their lives, their ambitions, their journey and their relationship with the greatest motorsporting event in the world. I'm Chris Pritchard and with me is Steve Plater. Steve, how are we doing, mate? Tip top, Chris, thank you. Yeah? Yeah, mighty fine. Apart from this rain. It's terrible, isn't it? Yes. But hey, that's, that's the price you pay for living on such a beautiful island. It, it does rain every now and again. <laughs> and while we're talking about people that live on the island, that segues us lovely into our guest today. Connor Cummins. In my eyes, and we'll discuss this with him, and I'll get your opinion on it, the greatest TT racer to never win a TT. Yeah, that's a pretty good description, mate. It really is. I'm sure it's one that he doesn't like, but it just goes to show just how good this guy is. A different character, very, very fast. Stood on the podium with me before and uh, still has the potential to win mm -hmm. a big race as well. Shall we get into it? Let's do it. Today's guest is local man Connor Cummins. You could say there is no racer who knows a place better than him. Born and raised right here on the island is a Ramsey resident who's as famous on the island for his entrepreneurial spirit as he is for his exploits around the TT course. He tried his hand over on the mainland circuit racing before heading back to the island to make his TT debut in 2006. And it only took him three years to go from newcomer to podium finisher with a third place in the second Supersport race in 2009. He's the owner of a coffee shop and now pizzeria in Ramsey, as well as the title of the fastest Manxman ever. And after this year's TT, he's the fastest rider ever on a Honda Fireblade around the island. The only thing it seems he doesn't own, not the way I wanted to start this podcast, Connor, a TT victory, that's the only thing you're missing. Mate, I wouldn't stand for that. Just thinking of a diplomatic response, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like the elephant in the room, though, isn't it? You... Yeah, it's a fair big elephant, yeah. I tell you what, let's we'll get to it later. We'll get to it later because it is, yeah, we've had many a discussion on this podcast about the fastest rider who's never won a TT. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know which way we look at it, your name does crop up. But like I say, before we get there, let's let's go back to the star line. We ask everybody that comes on the podcast the same question in different iterations, depending on what mood I'm in. But you've put your helmet on, you've put your gloves on, you said bye to the team, you're rolling through no man's land, you get that hand on that shoulder, you're waiting for those 10 seconds to pass. What's going through your head? How are your emotions? Do you feel ready? Uh, I don't think I'm allowed to swear on this, am I? No, you can, yes. Um, Be as honest and truthful as you want. It's it's very very nerve wracking, um, particularly that run up to that no man's land as everyone knows it. Uh, when you go through on your own, it's like I've you know check my lid and leathers and all. I go a little bit OCD and all that sort of stuff right before right before the off, and uh, then you sort of roll through into that you know counting everyone through ten seconds ahead of you, ready to get that tap on the shoulder. It's uh, it all goes very, very quiet. You've noticed there's loads of people sort of cheering you on on the sidelines and um, <clears throat> fairly unique would be the best way to describe it. I've not come across anything like a short circuit start line, even a Northwest or an Ulster, T Ulster Grand Prix start doesn't come close to a, a, that sort of getting ready to drop the clutch moment at a TT. It's, um, you have to be fairly in control of yourself anyway. Yeah, and here's a question. You've started number one. You've started further down the field. Is there a difference? Is it is it <clears> even worse the further you start down the field, like tenth, eleventh, waiting for those riders, seeing them go off, or not? I actually think it's worse being first on the road. Yeah, um, I've done that twice now, and you sort of you're the what did you call it? You clear the road. You're first first yeah, off yeah. and clearing all the dust and the leaves that's on the road and. Uh, it's uh, you get. I think you get all the build up of the pre race sort of all that sort of tension and all that goes on. All the because you're right at the front. Right at the front, yeah. You're you're first to go, and it's uh, very unique. Yeah, but yeah, definitely number one is, is uh, crap your pants moment. <laughs> before before we go any further and go look back at uh, of kind of how you started your career at the TT. 
just before we start the podcast, you were mentioning a specific start with a hand on the shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> Go on. Uh, yeah, so I had a, talking of unique starts, uh, I had a did the whole rolling up through the no man's land bit, got Hickman was off at number 10 in front of me and then I was literally sat at about eight, 9,000 revs on the, right on the biting, biting point of the clutch, ready to go, but had the guy holding my shoulder and I was spying the, the flag. Uh, and lit, I reckon I counted about just seven seconds before the flag, yeah, drops, if that makes sense. Bloody great big red light came on the on the timing box, and I was like, right, well, okay, well, that means unfortunately someone's fell off. Yeah, hope they're okay. Right, so I just chopped the throttle. We saw like, you know, what's going to happen next sort of thing. Next thing, the, hand, the flag dropped, and then the hand came off my shoulder. So you, you, it's drilled into you. If you see a red flag, you stop. Yeah, I didn't even get going, <laughs> and uh, I sat there probably two or three seconds, and the guy just went like. That. So on you go. And so that was I, it? Yeah. So So did you get credited that time? No. No. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. What, what, what the, so there was no red flag? There was no red flag, thankfully. Yeah. Thankfully everyone was okay and um but yeah, I was sort of sitting duck on the start line ready to get going and I was sat watching. I couldn't yeah, believe it. I remember yeah. Seeing so I was like going down the road and it's it's easy to think it's it's the it's the, the time I've dropped in that sort of whatever you, you want to call it uh but it's like you know yourself Stephen. You, it's getting going isn't it it's yep. like it, you sort of have to gather your thoughts what the hell well, i was just going to say how did that affect you mentally because obviously you know you cannot think of anything behind you you've got uh, to the tt you have to be 10 paces in front of yourself you know yeah uh, i mean I'd, i've just given the riders a load of free time not the I don't know whether this would have made a difference to the result but it certainly didn't help the result for sure mm -hmm. um and i had to really i would say it was probably around about Greba castle by the time i'd sort of composed myself because i had to i had to go like hell to start with and think right i'm in the clutches of the guy behind i've got to try and make up time try and get, settle into a nice rhythm mm. and just get going and it, it took a little bit of a yeah i'd say Greba castle by the time i got going again like which is what four miles five miles down the road uh, it's about four miles. Yeah, mm. yeah, maybe four. Yeah, four, four. Like you say, you only lose four, those five, two or three yeah. seconds on the grid, but you've, you, 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 you then lose a tenth here and a tenth there because you're just not into that mindset of of getting racing. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't riding particularly well the first few miles, um, mm -hmm. but I just had to really focus on. Just forget it, you know. Just drop yeah. it and focus ahead. But it took a while. I made a couple of little mistakes into one of like Quarter Bridge, Braddon Bridge. It just like it was really pissed off because yeah. of what happened um then i had to just to really chip away and chip away and it turned out all right i'm not gonna dwell on it too much yeah well, <laughs> listen we'll get to tt 2022 <clears throat> i think you know by all accounts it was just to finish that off you know when you when that flag flicks and drops and moves and goes up and down um what's the first thing that goes into your head what's your first thoughts what's your first concentration point don't wheelie yeah i try mm -hmm. not to wheelie after i try and nice steady like solid start and not try and pop the wheel up because it just you just lose time don't you and now i'm just looking straight down the road um all that sort of build off that we've just been discussing on that roll up uh, sort of period is gone as soon as i it almost sounds a bit cliche because you hear so many people say oh, as soon as the clutch drops that's it you, you it's so true you just everything just goes everyone that answers that question says exactly the same clutch goes bang it's into almost like into work mode yeah into war yeah and it's again it's it's, it's so unique to to what we do um mm. short circuit is just going to turn big charge into turn one elbows out and yeah hope the best. trying to stay on board <laughs> <laughs> so um we took we spoke to other people about it obviously we've had tt 2022 the first time we ever saw a warm-up lap in effect in the mornings mm. did that change your your um, preparation for going into the races or not? Um, no, I, I, first of all, I'm all for the warm-up laps. I think they're a great idea. Um, and Why? I'm, for what reason, mate? Um, I think 
sometimes TT doesn't always go to plan practice to practice wise you know we get delays and whatnot um, I think they come in really handy there if it's just an extra sneaky little lap just to, to get uh, a set up I suppose an extra laps but um, I think we had a particularly decent TT practice uh, weather wise so I actually decided just stay in bed an extra <laughs> bit longer um, just, just try and rest up because it's a, it's a tough old day at the office at a TT so I want to sit, you know, conserve my energy as best as I possibly can and, or could and i um, like to think it worked not so bad I was all, yeah like I say we'll get to it um, just touching on that we spoke to James Hilly in the previous one and he said he not that he was against the warm up but he loved the the feeling of going up to the start line and going from zero to what 170 180 down Bray Hill mm. like so did you not worry about that thinking that everyone else is up to speed just a little more if they've gone out and done that warm up lap um, no I, I never felt as though by not doing it I was on the back foot yeah. I, I, just purely because I think we'd had such a good run through practice yeah, I was happy where I was at you know I didn't really feel like I needed that extra button on the same token, if if I felt I needed it, I, it was there for us to use, yeah. and I'd have used it, not a problem at all. Um, but yeah, you can't emulate this, the the whole process of roll, you know rolling to the start line for a TT race. After that, for me, it was I've I've, I've had my laps around the course, so I felt comfortable mm. and ready to go. So um, I do think it's a great idea, though. It's a, a lovely introduction to TT. Yeah. yeah, I guess a lot Something of people new. Will have never experienced shooting off and in, no, I mean, in race mode. Quite a few changes for 2022, of course, mm. you know, in, in various different areas. But, uh, you know, going off on your own on practice as well as, um, you know, getting a warm up, which is, it's, I think is a positive because, like yeah. Connor said, you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But it, there's so many people that, that can struggle with machine problems and various different things. And however, the negative can be, you can break down. Yeah, yeah, and there's, I think if you got stuck in certain places, yeah. you weren't getting back either. That's right. Um, but no, I, th I think I forgot about the just setting off in single file. Um, I thought that was great, another great introduction as well. Because the last thing you want is to try and charge into you know, top of Bray Hill side by side someone. It's uh, tougher for the newcomers. Yeah, but, yeah, but, no one to follow. But probably easier for the for the established riders. Yeah. Yeah. So back in 2006, when you made your debut, were they, st they were, I might sound stupid when I say this, you weren't still racing in the rain back then, were you? They'd stopped that by then? No, still racing in the rain then. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael Dunlop won his first TT 2009, and it didn't rain for the full lap, but it was wet, Connor, wasn't it? It was yeah. wet and drying, yeah. and Michael destroyed everybody in the wet. Um, so lots of changes and, since, but since your it was, debut. It was dry by the end of the day, but it was that kind of, it was that era, mm -hmm. you know, it was, it was probably, I would say 2009 was the last time a race was set off in the in in not nice conditions. So potentially you could have been. Did you ride? So your debut 2006. How was it? Did you ride in the rain? Fortunately, we didn't ride in any damp weather, rain, whatever. You. Um, it you was remember amazing. About it? Pardon? What do you remember about it? Um, I just took my 20th birthday, and. 20th. Uh, t my birthday's all around TT time mm -hmm. you know, and it was just like there's no other pre present like it it was unreal absolutely unreal for a local as, as that's another sort of element to it um, a lot of there was a bit of negativity around me doing the TT so young you yeah. know I had no real road experience other than from uh, from family, Connor, or from um, just general public, or general public really. Yeah. Is a, I love the Alaman. I'm proud proud Manxman, but there was a, yeah. there was a few sort of noises made about I don't, you know, people not really agreeing with it. But they're entitled to their opinion at the end of the day. But yeah. I was always going to do what I was wanting to do, and um, I stuck to my guns. And yeah, it was awesome, absolutely unreal, best thing I've ever done. So how did you approach it? Like, like most people do, what, or what we hear about nowadays, in um, just enjoying your first TT. Just enjoying my first TT. Zero, I, yeah. zero expectations on results. We we had an R1 that we'd bought between us, like, our family. Um, I'd just come off the back of the R6 Cup. Yep. 
bought this R1, big intentions of doing the full British Superstock Championship. Our six cup was a one make series in the British mm -hmm. Championship. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and soon realised you need a fairly hefty budget to do all that. And then it was like, right, cut your cloth accordingly. What can we do? Um, so we painted the bike up and at that time it was like an Ori Haga rep sort of calls nice. the blue. I thought it was the bee's knees. Um, and then we w went to... Yeah, a little bit taller than Noriaga. A little, a little bit, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a bit more leather required there. <laughs> uh, bigger screen and all that stuff. Um, but, and then we went to Donington Park, never qualified. We were like two tenths outside qualifying for the stock race. Is this British championship? British super stock, yeah. yeah. Um, like my dad, me and my dad just turned up in the back of a tranny, ended up sleeping in the back of the tranny. Brilliant. Proper like yeah. grassroots job. Uh, never qualified, came home did the local Jerby job and uh, and then after that went to the Northwest 200 and that's the first road and I did quite well at the Northwest 200 and got picked up by uh, Sam Finley's uh, team racing as it was at the time and they they took me and my bike in they wanted to run me at the TT and rode Dunlops uh, it was just perfect just rode the Superstock bike in the Superstock and the Superbike races and yeah, it was it was awesome. So if you'd have had the money to go and do British Championship, is that where kind of where you thought your career was gonna go? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to just set an out and race, and you know, everyone has everyone has like aspirations of MotoGP. MotoGP, yeah. you think you just you're gonna make it, and you know all that sort of stuff. World Superbike, but you know, I, I learned from a fairly fairly early on. I was like to be realistic, you know, um, yeah, just it was just tall order and I've just sort of like right what what do I want to do and where where do I think I, I sort of fit in really excuse me um, yeah so off the back of the R6 Cup bought this, bought this stocker and just did what we could really and so it just took me on a, off in a totally different direction yeah the first time that year you know Northwest 200 your first road race who did you look up to then um, the, at your first event did you look up at the front guys and think oh dear that's a bit of me I can honestly say I don't. I wasn't really looking up to, with the greatest respect to everyone. I wasn't really yeah. looking up to anyone because I was just so focused on what I wanted to do myself. But perfectly aware at the same time, I was. I always used to follow the Irish roads when I was a kid. Uh, my dad raced on the roads as well in Ireland. I'm my uncle, and um, so it was always like you know. I think Darren Lindsay was there at the time. Ray Porter, yeah. uh, Martin Finnegan. Um, just to name just a few really so I, I was like bloody hell I'm on the same grid as these guys it was ace you know and obviously it's like it was McGuinness it was Hutchie I think he was on the McAdoo bikes at that stage himself I think with yeah, the 06 yeah. Um, so yeah it was uh, me and my granddad just rocked up in this sprinter van that we made just this 500 pounds pull out gazebo and just fired the bike in there and just rocked up and he was finished ninth in the Superstar race. Yeah. It was class. Going. And was that it? As soon as you'd gone out on the roads, uh, had you put the circuit racing to the side because you found this new passion or you were like, well, we can't afford to do that. I can afford to do this just and and, and actually I, I bloody love it. <clears throat> yeah, I, I'd, I'd um, from the early days, I didn't really want to, I wasn't really asked about the, the roads. Yeah. Then I bust my ankle at Alton Park in the R6 Cup. I had my ankle and cast we jumped on a little plane my cousin's granddad's plane flew across to castle rock in ireland watched the northwest and i think it was 05 um oh sorry 04 that was and then i thought i, I think we we're on the, the the coast road back towards the pits and i thought fucking hell this is the best thing since sliced bread <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> awesome to watch like and uh, i thought that that was a sort of light bulb moment for me yeah yeah and then Oh, oh six. I was, I was doing it. You know, it's unreal. When I, I ran out of petrol, one qualifying session uh, on the run down into Metropole. I never forget. It was right by the fuel station, and this old boy gave me a fiver. He said, uh, <laughs> "Stick a bit of fuel in and get back." Like, <laughs> I didn't put the fuel in the bike and spent it. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was just. You'd never really get that at a short circuit, would you? No. Well, you'd never break down and buy a fuel station for one, but yeah. <laughs> you know, it was such a nice sort of environment to be in. Um, 
I thought this is class is definitely a bit of me. So I want to go through it and that's that was me on my on my road sort of path. You mentioned uh, your father and yep. your uncle both raced. Yep. Were they were they road racers, T T? I don't I know very little about Yeah, my, um dad's done uh, he's done A T T. He was mainly Manx Grand Prix. Um my uncle Tyne and he's done Manx Grand Prix before. Um my uncle Lawrence, he does like Southern Hundred Road. So yeah, def roads is definitely in the blood for sure. It's uh what we're about so you were obviously born here yeah as was there no point when you were a kid when you were watching the tt because surely you'd go out and watch the tt when it was when it was on oh every every session yeah yeah but was that not was that not the because you'd think someone from the isle of man would as soon as they see a bike go around the tt course it's bang that's what i want to do but did that not that wasn't the light bulb moment yeah Mr. no um you just go and watch it for fun just go and watch it yeah my mum and dad i grew up about probably three or four hundred yards from trackside brilliant like Milntown Milntown yeah, jump yeah. so every morning practice whether it be TT or classic or Max Grand Prix I'd be at the end of the road watching the morning practices evening practices me and my dad and family would just go around the course and watch yeah, um, yeah and I, I'm still like that now I was out my arsenal at Ren Cullen last night just I thought this is class to go and watch some bikes oh mega you know loved it still love it so then fast forward three years after your debut you end up on the podium. Yeah. W was that expected that year? Did um, you think you were capable of doing that? It wasn't expected. I felt I'd built up nicely. Mm -hmm. um, had a crap 08. Bikes kept breaking down. It was just a, it was a joke, really. And in 09, I had some really good bikes with McAdoo guys. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we podium the, was it the first super sport race? Or second, I can't second, remember. Second, I think, second, yeah. yeah. Um, should have been second but I hit the kill switch after taking a tear off going across the start finish line <laughs> that was interesting flat out to off like virtually not yeah I bet <laughs> I thought I broke the motor or something but um, yeah how long did it take for the penny to drop it was a mistake um, I was for the time I crossed the line to probably just after the pit exit Oh, fairly quick then. Yeah, I was like, oh, what, what have I done? And next thing, I tried like dropping down a couple of gears just to get it bumped in. <laughs> it, <laughs> then when, I, when, the fire, when she fired up, it just chimed in in about third gear. I was lucky not to bollocks the engine, but yeah, I was lucky. And then I dropped a third behind Bruce, and yeah, I thought that'll do a nice little podium there. Oh yeah, that's not a bad podium to be. Well, uh, but Michael was he was on rails that day. Yeah, he was, he was good. Very good race this year. So then, from that moment, you get to two thousand and nine. You get your podium. Do you all of a sudden start to think, right? I, one, I can do this. Two, I'm capable of winning these TTs. Yeah, I think um, Penny sort of dropped there a little bit. I was that was like the first step to thinking I can, I can definitely make a go of this and mm. climb a few steps up. And uh, then I think we're. I was second to you in the senior that, that later the, in the week, wasn't I? In 09, yeah, you rode, you rode really well, yeah. So it was, that was that was good. I think after that race, the, the Super Sport podium was nice. I thought, bloody brilliant. This is like, that was like a, a bit of a dream of mine to, to end up on the box mm -hmm. at the TT, being a local and all the rest of it. And then after that, it was a senior and finishing second. And uh, that was like, I can, I can, I can do this. Especially if he's, if he's gone and won it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. But it was fast, wasn't it? The, the, the pace. Yeah, was, it was. It was mate, unreal. Yeah. So, uh, and then went to the Ulster that year and mm -hmm. did a lap record, won, won the races and stuff. So it was good. Just nice, nice progressive sort of steps forward. Steve, I'm going to pass over to you on this one because we get to 2010. What happened in 2010? Yeah, 2010, I'm laid in flipping hospital with a broken neck. Ah, uh, Northwest, remember. Um, and, you know, I'm, um, I'm talking to people in the paddock, you know, trying to keep up with what's going on at TT because I should have been there, obviously, just see who's doing what and so and so and blah, blah, blah. And obviously, you know, I get a message flipping guys gone down at Ballasque area and I thought, mm. oh, flipping heck, I'll be looking to see that boy again. Touch mm. wood, luckily, he went down very late and uh, got away with it, bless him. Um, and then of course your 
crash at the at the veranda, which was flipping spectacular. And I've never really spoken to you about it. Um, but, you know, you were riding really well that year anyway, uh, especially on the big bikes. But um, were you just pushing too hard? Um, no. No. Definitely not. That's not, I'm not in that, you know. No, it's just blaming it's you. It's a reasonable just, question. I wasn't there either, but it just it didn't yeah. look like done anything wrong at all. No. Um, Christ, where'd you start? I mean, I, I didn't really... Do you remember the point of losing the front? No. Right, yeah. I have a vivid... No, I don't, it's not vivid. That's nonsense. I have a, a vague memory of when I knew I was... I was, in, I was airborne, like, you know, it was yeah. all going a bit wrong. Um, but I had... Um, so you'd go through all all rehab and you sort of, I got to a point where I was, like, coming... I was probably halfway through my rehab with my injuries and whatnot. And I actually, it was, I sat down with one of the, I think it was a sector marshal, chief sector marshal, Mike. Um, he was right on the corner. And luckily I got to talk to him, you know. Um, so that was, I felt sort of- He actually saw it happen. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. He, he he was he saw the whole, whole thing. So he like uh, sat down with him and it was right at the time where they're doing all the filming for the Closer to the Edge film. Yeah. So it was all like, it was all documented and all the rest of it. So, um, but he basically said, it's all line of sight of marshals, isn't it? They That's have right. to look like back up the road and be vigilant and whatnot. So um, he basically said, he come into the black, black hut. Yes. He said, you can see that the, each rider come into view and they disappear in the corner. And then he, he said, you can count, I can't remember how many seconds he said, it, but he said you can count from the time they disappear to interview again. Yeah, is sort of X sort of seconds. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said I arrived just a little bit earlier, so a bit quicker. <clears throat> but he said you were bang online, and nothing was amiss. Like you know, it just looks look good. And he said right at that moment that I went into the corner. He said it went, it was it was windy, and he said it went really cold. No. And it was it was like which is not have gone down um but the i think the most significant thing there and this is what i've pinned it all on was the wind was bad yeah um because it was bad that day like you know um and that's what i've concluded that was the root cause of why i went down um i just i didn't feel any I wasn't offline or anything like that. No, look, look, mint. They didn't. Um, it was just. I've only really... seen on the TV what everybody else has seen upstate, but it's just. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like there was no mistake, no nothing, and that's why I asked the question. Really. Yeah, it was sort of. Couldn't really explain it, you know. Yeah. But I sat down with Chris Palmer. Yep. Uh, when uh, North One were good enough to to give me the footage of the crash, because it's all documented on. Heavily documented, actually. <laughs> to be fair. Yeah. Um, and that was like a bird's eye view. I could just see everything, and we we both agreed that that's what the cause was so do you feel that's why it's talked about so much because it was documented on the on the documentary yeah like spectacular flipping crash oh yeah well, it was but you probably you know, would you have seen that it'd be spectacular would you have seen normal arms and legs yeah. flying through the air not them <laughs> no but seriously sorry to jump in chris right. but just well, i just you know going back to um uh this year's TT just flashing over, really, really windy conditions on the super bikes. Yeah. Does that make you nervous in those scenarios, situations now when you get back out on the big bikes, especially? Um, I wouldn't say nervous. It, it makes me, I'm, I'm more more concerned yeah. really about like, uh, I'm sort of thinking of everyone really. I know how bad it can be, you know, and. Yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, I was concerned, put that way. It's the safest thing to say, like. Did you feel that that was your one chance of winning the TT there and then back in 2010? Because, like, were you leading before Guy came down or was Guy leading when Guy came down and then you were leading when you came down? Uh, um, I don't know. I can't remember if I was leading the, the initial run. Yeah. I might have been. Then the rerun... I was third. It was mm -hmm. like three seconds between me, Hutchie, and John. Because Hutchie, that was the race Hutchie went out, wasn't it? And then got back yeah. in with Clive as, as a... Yeah, yeah it was like it an was oil, yeah. oil leak or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, really weird day. 
well, yeah. Very, very weird. <laughs> <laughs> to end where you ended. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. fast forward on from that, you know, um, from waking up and realizing, or the realization of what had happened, yeah. to the decision to carry on, how long a process was that? Um, well, I was back on the bike in nine months. Yeah. Uh, and I, it was never going to be a mental block that was going to stop me from bike, getting on the bike again. It was always going to be a physical thing. Right, I see, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Because at all, like, major back trauma and all the surgery, I'd, like, I've still got everything in now, like, all my rods in my back. Um, Titanium, or are you a cheapskate? Stainless? Um, it's all rusty, isn't there? I can't remember what I chose on the menu. I think titanium, that's all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something to be proud of. Yeah. Um, no, it's a cheapskate. <laughs> <laughs> it's wood. Yeah, yeah. Two v two or something. Yeah, uh, so it's just the physical side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because and the biggest single, the, the single most biggest thing that was going to stop me was I had a nerve palsy, so I basically shattered my humerus. Yeah, and um, it sent my radial nerve to sleep, so I had a floppy wrist, and I couldn't do that. I couldn't flex my fingers. Right. And that was always going to be the thing that was going to stop me. Um, like broken bones, you can fix. I had me, me left knee rebuilt. I can bend it to like, I can only bend it so far. That's why you probably see me with a big seat, seat film, low pegs, right, yeah. just so I can actually get range. Um, not necessarily the best going around left-handers, but mm. it's doable. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the, the nerve was going to be the big thing because it's. It was proper tangled up. It was bruised and stretched, so it just sent me sent my arm to sleep, basically. How long was that before it came back to sensations? Um, oh, well, obviously, of oh, same injury. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Uh, yeah, mine, mine was severed, um, and luckily uh, they've got it kind of back to some kind of normality. But you know, it's a quite a frightening time for life lifestyle, not just riding motorcycles. Mm. For, you know. Uh, for life in general you can't do anything from doing buttons up on your flies to laces to flipping and you have to readjust your whole life um how long was it before you started getting sensations some sensations back through uh the radial nerve to get to feel back in the fingers so i went to the accident was in the june and then i went over to silverstone bsb with friends peter and marcus and I'm not sure whether it was the whole buzz of being around a racetrack again and in a paddock, but on the way, on the drive back up the road, I had my arm resting on like the armrest and it just, it, it flinched my wrist sort of, cause that was the oh, thing yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't do that. Yeah. And it, it sort of kicked in a little bit and that was the start of it. But it, after that, it was all, um, I had brilliant people around me, not to mention my surgeons, but uh, Kath Davis, uh, yeah. Rex Physiotherapy, absolutely shit up and we did all these this rehab was you know i was mirroring she was holding my left hand lifting it up i was copying it with my right so like memory sort of stuff mm -hmm. and just rebuilt it right from the ground up again and as i say nine months later i'm back on a bike i didn't have necessarily the great great strength in the left side yeah yeah in fact i did the tt pretty much that year just holding on with my right yeah. and that's what promoted all arm pumps I ended up having a fasciotomy on my right arm just to alleviate some kind of because you was compensating pressure. so much yeah, yeah 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 left side was just a bit of a passenger i could just i could change gear okay when you know had to rebuild my head did all the testing went to cartagena as everyone did back then and then went to the first british round superstock which is absolutely a cracker's class anyway it's, it's it's really tough and there i was sort of bimbling around never qualified went in the non-qualified race finished third got into the main race and we just, just kept building building just proper from the ground up and you know I, it, it's not many teams who would have allowed me to do that yeah yeah um, well, well well i guess we'll get onto those teams we're going to wrap part one up here this seems to be a good point right yep because it, it's only going to be uphill from here 
but it's only going to be downhill. It's only going to get better. The story <laughs> just gets better and better. That's what I'm trying to say. That's what I'm trying okay. to say. So join us for part two next week. <laughs> <laughs>